So, good afternoon. Um, we're here to talk about the future of food and, um, and some, of the, uh, some of the ethical and um, innovation questions that that brings up. Um, I think all of us today are feeling climate change. Uh, it's awfully hot out. Uh, and um, the uh, production of meat is certainly um, hastening that, according to experts, um, who say that our current situation uh, is just not sustainable. It takes uh, 2,400 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. Um, and it takes 20 times less land to feed a person than uh, by plants than it does by meat. In the US alone, 56 million acres of land are used just to grow food for animals and only 4 million for plants. So how, is, how are things going to change? If we look at the, what was in the news just in the last week, we have an idea of how dramatic of a change may be coming. Tyson Foods, which is headquartered in the US and um, has $40 billion in revenues in 2018, it's one of the world's largest producers of meat, uh, has just announced that it plans to produce nuggets based on pea proteins. Now, they started back in 2016 to invest in startups that are making meat substitutes like hamburgers and so forth. Um, and three years later, they've decided to go into the business themselves. And what we need to watch and see is how is that going to impact the startups? Because Tyson has 50 giant processing facilities just for chicken all over the world, whereas the biggest Silicon Valley competitor has one plant in Silicon Valley. Um, in other news this week, um, as the world moves from meat to plant, one big US fast food chain, Arby's, which uh, specializes in meat sandwiches, is going in the opposite direction. It is introducing a new product called the Merit that looks like a carrot, but is actually made from meat. <laughs> they are um, cooking it uh, sous vide, coloring it with carrot colored uh, co color, and then glazing it with maple syrup and uh, garnishing it with a bit of parsley so that it looks like a healthy carrot, but actually isn't. Um, and finally, yesterday, Barclays uh, released a study that estimates that um, the market for edible insects will reach $8 trillion by 2030. And they are projecting that big food companies like Nestle and Pepsi-Cola and Tyson will move into, uh, into serving um, edible insects to people. So, you know, with that in mind, let's take a, let's now turn to our panelists. Um, to my immediate left, Frank uh, Kuna. He um, is um, now an active shareholder in, uh, in RAP, which is um, one of the largest um, seasonings company in, in Europe. Um, a big part of their business is focused on seasoning of meat. So as we move away from meat, and more people become so-called flexitarians. Um, how is your company going to adjust its business uh, going forward? Good, good, good question. <laughs> um, I think the one thing you, we need to understand at that point is meat per se has a very good taste, even without seasoning. And the more you move in meat replacement, the less it tastes. So the challenge is to make a non-animal protein piece of something tasteful needs a lot more of our attention. So we are looking very bright into the future because there's going to be a bigger demand for our products. OK. 
Okay, great. Let me now turn to Allison. And now, Allison, your company is um, producing an alternative to chicken. Tell us a little bit about that. So <clears throat> basically, we develop vegan products based on a rare tree mushroom with highly unique properties. Um, it's huge. It has a very fibrous structure and a very umami taste, it's quite like chicken. And it also has very high levels of protein and lots of vitamin D. And my company, so my teammates and I, we just stumbled across this mushroom by chance a few years ago, while at the same time I became interested in meat alternatives. So while I realized that if you're trying to cut down on meat, you have the option between something that's really bland and the option between something that's really highly processed, I stumbled across this mushroom and thought, this is fantastic. There, there must be products made out of this mushroom. And I realized there weren't any, and I realized this mushroom had never been produced commercially before, ever. So my team and I, we did some research, and we worked on producing the mushroom, and after about two years, we hit the goal, we managed to produce it. So now we are co-founders of a company that produces this mushroom and we develop different products from it. And you've gotten some funding from the German government for this. Yes, yeah, so we're fully funded by the German government at the moment and we are in different innovation clusters around Germany. For instance, we are in the EIT Food, which is the European Institute of Technology for Food and we have other funding pots as well. Okay, thank you. So let's now move to uh, Nick. Uh, let, what's your point of view on, on, on all of this? You know, is the current system sustainable and how quickly do we need to move away from the way we eat today? So um, the current system is not sustainable, definitely not. And um, I, I'm very afraid that we are, yeah, go directly into a social disaster. So, um, Two Australian scientists published an article or study last month um, on climate risk. And the study was based or is based on a scenario approach, and it shows that there is a risk that um, the human civilization will end in 2050. It's just a worst case scenario, but there is a risk. And we Why, because we would not have enough food, or because we will have destroyed the climate, or both? Di different, different <laughs> effects. So our main effect is stemming from, from climate change, and there are different factors that contribute to climate change, and we know that our food system uh, contributes to climate change. So um, I think we have to stand up now. We have to come up with a new solution. We have to innovate the entire industry, otherwise we have no chance to survive in the long run. So, um, and what I'm seeing on, on the market is that um, for a long time we were just talking about incremental um, improvements. We were talking about um, efficiency, resource efficiency, and so on. But that's not enough. So in 2050, about 10 billion people will live on this planet. So, and this means if we want to want to have a chance for our future, we have to think about radical um, new approaches. We need not single improvements. We need a shift in paradigm of how to produce food. OK, so how do we scale up? Because today, the startups that are working on alternatives are still pretty early, early stage, and the the meat industry, uh, it's, I don't know, 80 billion, I, I don't know how much, but uh, I mean, it's a huge worldwide industry um, with a lot of processes in place. Um, and we don't have the same scale for alternatives today. So um, one thing that's being talked about more and more is this idea of using insects for protein. Um, uh, I think crickets have 60% six, protein compared to chicken, which is about half of that. Um, and I've, I've heard experts say that like 
children who are starving in underdeveloped countries, if they ate one or two crickets a day, it would make a huge difference. But we have huge um, cultural um, barriers and, and habits to, to overcome. Um, what does everybody think about insects as an alternative and a way of, 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 of solving this problem? If you go in a global perspective, um, uh, I think insect protein will play a crucial role. If you look in the European market, uh, if you look in the German market, there's this, what you already mentioned, cultural pattern behavior eating a cricket. That's challenging. So I was three, four weeks ago in Amsterdam. Uh, we sat down with a startup. They have grass-fed crickets. So they actually say you can taste the different grass the cricket eats, so they're very fancy. It took me quite some time to eat it, and it was not nice. <laughs> so uh, I think this is very challenging um, uh, to overcome this kind of barrier in your head, and I'm uncertain how this is going to play out, at least in Europe. Um, Alison, I think you have a point of view on that too. I mean, uh, on, on how difficult it is to get people to, to change their, their patterns. Yeah, definitely. I mean, introducing a tree mushroom into the market is also challenging because tree mushrooms are generally not eaten, at least in Germany. So it's definitely a big marketing and branding issue, I have to admit. As for crickets and other insects, I have had some as well because um, when I went to a challenge in Denmark, um, I think two and a half years ago, they had crickets in the University Mensa crickets and worms of different kinds. And I tried them all because um, it's my business and um, <laughs> they were fine, but a bit bland, I have to say, not gonna lie. So you need seasoning for them, right? <laughs> you need seasoning, probably. But also, um, as far as I know, um, insect protein is quite um, challenging because lots and lots of people um, develop allergies against proteins from insects. Also, Insects are not easily scalable, so you'd have to really have a huge amount of insects to develop the kind of protein that you can buy meat. And really, I'm not sure if mass farming insects should be replacing mass farming other animals, because, okay, so I'm not, I'm not a huge insect enthusiast, but you have the same problems mass farming insects than you do with other animals. You'll have to introduce antibiotics probably. And also, I mean, who knows? Maybe it's not great for the insects either to be mass farmed in huge quantities. The, if I can follow up on that, because uh, as far as I know, I'm not quite sure if everybody's aware about cultured meat or in vitro meat, like lab-grown meat, animal lab-grown meat. Um, the studies right at the moment shows that growing insect protein, like insect meat, as a lab-grown protein is a lot easier than actually grown animal protein meat. And so we might just leapfrog, instead of farming crickets in huge houses and feeding them, straight into a bioreactor and growing the insect protein in this kind of artificial setup, which would be different uh, impact on consumer behavior, awareness for the product, because you don't eat the whole cricket, you only cheese like the, I don't know how you call it, the buddy. Or, the meat. Nick, do you have a point of view? I mean, is the future of food in being going to be grown in a lab, or will it be found in nature, or how do we, how do we scale up to um, feed an additional couple of billion people? So I think that on the one hand, we, we can see interesting developments uh, these days. So um, there are new products, as, as you said before it. Uh, we can talk about uh, vegetarian meat. So I think it's ready for the mass market. So also because vegetarian or vegan meat, now it's equal in terms of taste to conventional products. So this means sustainable consumption without uh, sacrifice. It's one of the main drivers for consume, uh, con, uh, sustainable uh, consumption. So we can also see reaction of the stock markets. So I think all of you know uh, Beyond Meat. The IPO was at the beginning of May last month, so this year, we're talking about a phase of eight, eight weeks. So was, I think the, the starting price or the imitation price was $25, now we are about uh, $150 per share. So this shows me that the 
our financial markets just understand the potential of food innovations. So, and I think it's a good thing because um, now billions of dollars are invested into alternatives uh, for the food market. So you said the term uh, leapfrogging. I really like leapfrogging. And I think we, we should think in also very innovative directions. So what is about digital food? Digital food follows the idea to separate physical products from the intended outcome. So this is not a new idea. Um, we have celebrated it in the, f in the uh, music industry. So in former times, music was bound um, to physical products such as a disc. So and today, we can enjoy music over the air. So if we apply this idea to food, we can say, okay, let's separate food and the outcome of food in terms of uh, flavor. So we can create flavor through our digital stimulation of our brains. So at least flavor is, is nothing more than an electronic impulse. If that and happens, what happens to your business? <laughs> I'm just wondering about that as well. <laughs> I need more IT guys, I guess. Um, I, th I think the, there, there are a couple of layers in here which I find very interesting. And um, the, the, the one layer where I absolutely agree up with you is we're going to see an, I don't know if the word is right in English, artification, like we're going to see artificial foods. Similar to, we just saw this um, plastic presentation, 1950, plastic was introduced in the mass market and it's all over the world now. And I believe we are at the brink of this change that um, in the next 20 years, food will be a lot more artificial than anything we can imagine. And that this picture of the organic grown animal that you can touch will fade away and be replaced by something else. So I, I think that's, that would be the disruption we're gonna see. Um, on the other side, well, I'm, if you see the impact of all the processed food we have consumed over the last 50 years as a consumer, and if you look in the United States and you see obesity, uh, health and heart problems, um, they are linked very much by um, um, a mislead of what is good for you, because it's sweet and it's salty and tsunami and so on and so on. I'm not sure if it's a good idea to try to trick the brain in a way to give them something else that it's actually expecting by DNA, culture, habits, I don't know. And that's why I'm getting very uncertain if this is the right direction we should steer the system to. Well, maybe, I mean, if we don't use some, some approach, a digital approach like this, how do we overcome the cultural barriers? So, Allison, you were talking about, like, a friend of yours works for a hotel chain, right? Uh, and uh, they tried in Germany to, um, to introduce uh, one day a week for the staff to eat vegetarian, and everyone opposed because they wanted, absolutely wanted their, their um, sausages um, at, at lunchtime, right? So how do we wean people off of meat, and how do we ensure that whatever the alternatives are, are actually healthy for us. Um, so do we know, for example, if lab-created proteins, how is that going to impact our health? Is, is anyone studying that? Do we know if it's a good thing? So <clears throat> what you were implying to is that um, Everyone knows the bubble. Everyone knows that whatever you look at on the internet, for instance, you will be shown similar content. And I think that's very much the same in society. So while we're talking about the future of food and while we may think about, hmm, how much meat should I eat? Should I eat meat at all? Should I maybe only eat meat once a week? We are just a tiny percentage of the people living in Europe or in the world or in Germany. And there are many other people who do not have those thoughts. So when my friend told me, who works in the hotel industry, that they tried to introduce one vegetarian day a week in the Mensa, 
90% of the staff said, oh my goodness, no, because they wanted their sausage every day. Um, I think that just shows that I don't think there will be radical change, but I think there is change in some way. So it's good to, um, to, to look at change and to see what we could do. And I also think that there are so many different aspects of trying to have change and so many different people you want to reach. If you want to reach the people who are um, wor worried about hurting animals, you will have to have different products than if you're trying to reach people who are worried about the environment. If you're trying to reach the mass market, what you were just um, saying, I think you do probably need products that mimic meat. So I think products like Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger and all of them, they will probably get better and better. And if you have something that tastes like meat, smells like meat, looks like meat, then that will probably be the best solution for the mass market but it's by far not the only solution because we're not all the mass market. So I'm wondering what the timeline on all of this is. And I think that we have in the audience, um, uh, is Roland here? Yeah, yeah, over here. So you, you are, um, you know, you're representing a company that produces uh, and distributes meat, I think. So. So, so what, what's your point of view on this? How long will it take the industry to adopt? My name is Ronald Dotgrink. I'm uh, CEO of Vion and uh, from the, I'm one of the biggest meat companies in Europe. Um, I very much agree with Alison. I think it's a balanced approach. We have to strike a new balance, and I do believe uh, in plant meat, I do believe in lab-grown meat, and I do believe in animal meat. And I think uh, they're all part of the diet, because as Alison said, people in China, people in Asia, they don't care about sustainability, about animal welfare, yet. They care about having meat in the first time. We are used to it for many years. And they are not used for many years. So I think the meat production, animal meat, will grow. It will get lesser in Europe, will get lesser in, in Germany, maybe 20% lesser in 10 years, maybe 30%. We will replace it with plant meat, maybe with insects, maybe with lab-grown meat. I believe in them all. Uh, but I think it's a very balanced approach what we need. So we need to... I think here in, in Germany and in Holland, we need to show where, where, we do, where we do, we, do we want to go. We as Fion invest in plant meat as well. I think lab meat is a little bit further away, but it will come. Insects may be a little bit further away, but it will come as well. So I think it's a balanced approach. So I believe in all three of them, but uh, let's be aware, worldwide scale is quite different from North Europe. Ronald, if, you, if I may, can I ask a question? The, because I'm, what you just said, I'm, I'm a strong believer that the consumer is not going to change its behavior. We're going to want to have a burger patty as we know it, if we've grown up with it. We're going to want, want to have a steak as we know it, as we grow up with it. If you're going to go into a new product development as Vion, are you going to create a new product? Or are you going to copy an existing product with different ingredients, but not animal protein? Well, the answer is quite clear. We have investigated. You need to do both. Because you're, for some people, you're believable if you have a meat alternative, because they're used to structure and taste. And other people say, what's well, stupid? Why do you need to mimic meat? And the whole market gets, gets fragmented. That's just clear. And I think one thing which is not mentioned about uh, uh, plant meat or not meat alternatives, we did some investigation about it. I think it's about taste and structure, but it's also about price. And the tipping point, I think, is, is not there yet, but within the next few years, the tipping point will be there. And if we have the price of meat alternatives below meat, then I think we will get an acceleration of consumption. So price is crucial, because we're sitting here like people, they have, we have all three meals a day, and we have enough money to buy things, but that's only for the top 30, 40% of the people. So price is crucial. And when that takes off, that's a tipping point. 
Nick, what's your reaction to this? Is this going to be, is this enough change fast enough? Uh, I, I think I have bad news for you. Um, I, I think the future for your business, um, I think there is no future for your business, to put it in a nutshell, <laughs> to be honest. No, let, let me ex explain what, what we can see today. Um, I think we might have the perfect storm now. So there are different factors on the market. So we, we, we know that our, our lifestyle is unsustainable. We become more and more aware of the, of the real price of the food industry. So, and what we can see is we can see a young generation, generation greater. This generation um, raised, raises its, its voice, and I think this generation is willing to blame the traditional industry, and it's very open for food innovation, first point. The second point is, um, as I said before, the Beyond Meat story. So the new products, alternative products, are ready for the mass market. And then what we can also see is that a lot of money now is invested into alternative, pro alternative uh, food innovations and so on. And taking all different developments together, I think we can have now a very interesting tipping point. So I know consumers. I know that there is an attitude behavior gap. This means on the one hand, consumers always say, yes, we want to uh, have more sustainable food or sustainable products or sustainability on the markets and whatever. So they also time and again say, um, yes, we are willing to pay a price premium. But on the other hand, uh, they just focusing on about prices. So, and they are really interested in low prices for, for their meat, they want to buy the uh, schnitzel or whatever for, for five euro a kilo and so on. We know that. So, but I think consumers are able to change. So, and they are... I really, don't agree. No, it depends on the alternative. If, as, as you said before, if we have a product that tastes exactly like the old one, that is more healthier than the old one, and the price is the same, um, then you are really in trouble with your traditional business. I'm not so, in trouble, you're stating exactly my point. Uh, but you're not thinking in a very disruptive way. So I think today we talked about uh, disruption, we talked about exponential development of technology. So, and this means, so we will see the biggest technological disruption ever in the next years. So we do not know what will go on in the next years, but I'm absolutely aware that there will be a lot of radical food innovations, and in this, and if they are come on the market, consumers are willing to change because they are better. Let's ask the audience. Um, <laughs> let's ask the audience. How many people here have tried uh, a meat substitute product? Raise your hand. Okay. How many people in the audience? That's a fairly good number. How many people? And you can't talk to me ready? after this. <laughs> Please. <laughs> how many people in the audience are ready to um, give up meat? Okay, um, less, but still, uh, still, uh, I, I think it's a fair amount. Uh, so that's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, development. I'd like to reply to Nick uh, at one point because, you, like, and that's something I find always disturbing having these discussions because we're very much EU centered here. We are how many are we in the European Union? Thirty? No, three hundred eighty million people, consumers, something like that. Three hundred. Jesus Christ, you talked about 10 billion people 2050. Right now we are at 8 billion, right, or something like that? We are just so tiny little bit. The Americans, I'm not quite sure how sustainable they are at the moment in thinking. The Chinese, the Indian haven't started to eat animal protein. We haven't talked about Africa and some of the societies or economies there. Indonesia, a rising economy. 
Um, they are, I think in Germany roughly we do eat 60 kilogram per meat per head per year. They are, Nigeria, Africa, 15 kilogram. I think this is, we might eat one day less. Yeah, I don't believe that. They start to eat three days more. And that's going to have a huge impact on, on this kind of system. And I think uh, Ronald should actually move to China and grow his meat there, or Russia or Africa, uh, because that's going to be at least this old economy style business going on there. I do not think that China is the future market for you. I, I, no, um, there, there, is a, a, there was a decision from politics. So the aim of China is to reduce meat consumption within the next years up to 50%. That's true, that's its fact. Be why? Because they realize um, that the current way of lifestyle is not sustainable, they have to do something. And you know the system in China, they are able to do it. So, <clears throat> if, we, if we take as a given that meat consumption is going to drop and there will be more demand for products like um, the tree mushroom. Let's look at, you know, what are some of the challenges in scaling that up? So let's talk about where you are right now in production um, and, and where you want to go and, and how long that might take. So we are producing. Um, we're working on producing the same amount every month reliably because the big challenge in producing biological things is that they do not always behave the way you want them to behave. Mushrooms have a very complicated sex life, I can tell you that. So basically, you might even see this mushroom growing on a tree. It's huge, it's bright yellow, and it grows near rivers. But just because you've seen that mushroom go there this year does not mean that you'll see it again next year or the year after, or maybe even ever again. So that's what we're working on. What I would definitely like to say is, I think it's very interesting to sit down and think, why does meat taste like meat? And then invent something that is like meat, but not meat. But that's not the only way. We have so many things growing in nature that are fantastic but no one really thinks about them, talks about them, like our tree mushroom. It's such an incredible thing that this mushroom really, really, really looks like chicken and tastes like chicken and is super high in protein. I'm just advertising a little bit. But still, no one has ever done something with it. Why? There are an unbelievable amount of mushrooms that have not been researched at all. And if you go into other countries, like I'm working together with a design team that's composed of um, people from Russia and China as well, they eat so, many, so much more mushrooms. Why don't we? Why don't we look into other areas? Do we really have to copy meat? I think we probably do have to copy meat for a certain market, talking about the balanced approach again, but that's not the only solution. We should just try and introduce other protein sources, use other materials, and try to go away from normal agriculture that's so wasteful, but try and use substances that for now are just being discarded. And mushrooms are perfect for that because they can grow on waste products. You want to add to that, Frank? I, I, I know Rap's got some interesting things cooking about you know, how you want to bring people together to innovate around food. So what's, what are your thoughts? That would be a different topic, and I could talk hours about that, um, which is linked to the invitation yesterday evening, the dinner, the dinner we have had. Um, in, and I already brought that point up. I'm, I, I'm very much with Ronald in, the, in regard of that I believe that the consumer is going to have a mimic product, a, a product that he's used to. And I'm, I'm, there are quite other products in the market. Jackfruit is very similar to what you're saying. Okay, yeah. yours tastes better. Good. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I don't, I was just asking myself the question, if you're going to, the, the question they've answered every time at the end of the panel, where do you think we are in, what are, gonna, what are we going to eat in 20 years here uh, uh, during the DLD lunch break? Um, would be a nice question. I don't think it's going to be, it, perhaps there's going to be some wood tree slices uh, on the menu. Yeah. 
I would say it's a 3D printed um, animal protein, bioreactor grown meat, labeled with grass fed, highly sustainable, organic, something. And very, very tasteful, even without our seasonings. That would be my <laughs> perspective on that. <laughs> maybe some bread made out of insect flour? Maybe, maybe you just need a pill in the morning that is perfectly adapted to our um, individual uh, nutritional needs. Why not? And maybe we'll print what we want? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> okay. So now, it is, as Steffi said, it is time for lunch. Please give a, 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 a big round of applause to our panelists.